some of my f- favorite parts of the of the Bible, I think, of First and Second Timothy. Now, I know every time, every chapter of the Bible, it seems like I'm like one of my favorite parts of the Bible. But, <laughs> but there's something about Paul's letters to Timothy, especially if you're in the ministry or you got a heart for the ministry. You like preaching. You like preaching the gospel. You like, you know. Uh, handling God's word. If you're a young, quote unquote, preacher boy or something like that, man, these verses are always great. And it's one of those those parts of the Bible that you can say, man, I just, what should I read in my Bible today? I need something to just kind of pump me up a little bit. Man, turn to First and Second Timothy. You can go to almost any verse and it'll just really pump you up uh, to get motivated for the Lord. But look at verse 19 there. It says, uh, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, obviously, we spend a lot of time preaching the gospel. Uh, just tonight, I had two different people that said, uh, in essence, they are quite certain they're going to hell if they were to die today. I mean, they just have that feeling like, right now, I wouldn't, is what they they literally said. And unfortunately, both cases, uh, I don't know if just... Uh, Satan working or what the deal was, but both of them kind of got shut down and, and wasn't able to present the gospel to him. But uh, uh, but anyway, one of the ideas, you know, we constantly preach when we're preaching the gospel, hey, it's not your works that's going to get you to heaven. You know, it's not how good you are, or how many sins you turn from or anything like that. So that's a common message that we preach. But this this we know, if you are a Christian, if you are saved, you ought to turn from sin. Right, you ought to purge yourself of iniquity. Uh, you ought to live the best life that you can. I think that should go without saying. We all should should know that. You know, it's not like that makes us legalists. We certainly don't believe you have to do these things to go to heaven. But you're a Christian now, so you should depart from iniquity. Now, uh, the question is, how do we go about doing that? And so, I want to present uh, tonight this concept, okay? The title of the message is Going Cold Turkey. I think you'll understand where I'm going with this. Going Cold Turkey. Now, the actual origin of this of this phrase is debatable. I tried to find the origin. I love looking up the etymology of words and phrases, and uh, I don't usually remember them for very long, but it's interesting to me <laughs> whenever I do look them up. Uh, but I looked up, and, and I just checking the origin, and it's one of those phrases that nobody knows for sure where it came from. They've got different ideas. They can go back and say, well, it was used in the early 1900s, but it was more commonly used in the 40s and, and all, and you can just kind of get an, uh, just a rough guess, uh, but no one really knows where it came from. There's one uh, you know theory out there that said it comes from uh, eating turkey while it's cold rather than warming it up, you know, just kind of like, uh, you're kind of, uh, uh, everyone's probably been there. Like with the pizza, for instance, you know, you're like, man, should I take the time to go heat this up? Nah, cold pizza's good. And you just eat it, right? Cold turkey. Uh, you just, just don't heat the turkey, just eat it cold. I don't know if that has anything to do with the etymology of the word, uh, but some people think that. Some have made reference to kind of like what we would call goosebumps. When you get cold and your, your skin kind of looks like that. Uh, some people say, this is one thing that I read that said, like when somebody goes cold turkey off of certain drugs, they have these these terrible withdrawals as a result of it. And real quickly, uh, just not really part of my notes, but I know this, that there are particular addictions that somebody has that if they go cold turkey off of it, it could even be fatal. Supposedly they could they could die from like the the... Uh, uh, withdrawals could be so bad that they go into like they have seizures and they die. And, and I just heard uh, someone at night said he uh, he died basically like two times. And he was talking about how, you know, it's amazing that he's even lived. And I said, well, what did you die from? He says seizures. You know, so, you know, I certainly wouldn't want anyone to go cold turkey and then die, you know, as a result of it. But I, I don't know. Uh, but But apparently people that would, you know, try to go cold turkey, as, as what we would say, they would they would have these bumps, uh, you know, from being cold, like cold sweats. I don't know. Uh, to me, that argument sounded kind of weak, but some people say that there's some reference to that uh, in history that they say maybe that's where it came from. But we understand what it means, okay? It means to just immediately go without something, you know, just to get it done immediately, get rid of it immediately, whatever the case might be. Uh, interestingly, as I was looking it up, uh, some article came up that was actually about some Gospel Coalition uh, Australia. I don't know if there's like an American 
you know, organization and an Australian organization or what, but this particular article was from an Australian outfit and it was about going door knocking and they called that going cold turkey. I don't know exactly what they mean by that, but, you know, maybe they had a different understanding of it, but apparently the idea was, you know, you don't have to plan your service and invite people to come and all that kind of stuff, but just go cold turkey door to door. And it's actually a great article. Like it's an evangelical church. Uh, I don't know about their beliefs at all. I know that the, uh, the links to the verses, like if you click on the link, it goes to like ESV or something like that. So it's not King James only, but on the article, you can't tell that it just gives you the references. And so I actually shared that on Facebook because I thought it was a great, it was a great article and it was neat to see that, Hey, the independent Baptists aren't the only ones doing that. Unfortunately, a lot of independent Baptists are getting away from it, but this is just a, you know, another evangelical organization. That's like, you know what it's really, what really works is going out there and just knocking on doors, cold Turkey and getting people saved. <laughs> it was a uh, pretty encouraging to read that. I think it was back from like 2014 or something like that. But so these are all the things in regards to cold Turkey, but what we typically mean is to just, you know, to depart from something immediately. All right, let me put it this way. Ripping the Band-Aid off. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. All right, when I was a kid, there was this idea like, oh, no, no, not too fast, not too fast. You got to, ow, ow, ow. And eventually your mom, right, she's just like, hey, let me show you how to do it. You're like, ah, oh, that's not so bad. <laughs> Rip it off. Does it hurt? Yes. But you got it. You just got it. Got it off. You know, you got it off fast. How about pulling a tooth? Anybody do that? I was a little kid pushing that around with my tongue. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> and you're like, why don't you just yank that thing out of there? No, no, no. I'll do it my way. And you're just slowly just agonizing over all this pain. You're sweating and all that. And finally, somebody comes and says, "Here, I'll show you how to do it." Uh, our uh, uh, he passed away now, but brother uh, A. F. Collins, uh, my kids, uh, we call him Papa, and uh, he had this supposedly uh, everyone in the family knew this. If you uh, had a loose tooth as a kid, you'd take him to Papa and what he would do is he's like, here, I'll take care of it. And he would put his thumb on your shoulder and he'd push real hard. So you're like, ow, that hurts. And while you're focusing on that pain, he would just go, yank. <laughs> and they didn't even know that, 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 that he had pulled their tooth. <laughs> but anyway, that principle of just ripping it off. Another example. How many of you guys have ever been into a freezing pool, right? And in the summertime, a freezing pool could be like 50 degrees and it feels cold. But, uh, but you know, what do you do? Sagmont, we go to Camp Sagmont, that cold, that, that pool is cold. It's like uh, somehow spring fed. I don't completely understand how that works, but all I know is it's cold. Every year, everyone talks about how cold it is. And so what, is mo what do most of the kids do? They put their toe in it and they're like, oh, no, no that's too cold. And so they go into the, the shallow end and they start slowly working their way up. And the higher the water gets, the more miserable they are, right? And then you got someone else just goes to the deep end and just jumps in, gets it over with. Do they suffer a little bit? Does it hurt? Yes, but they just get it over with, okay? And so I want to talk about tonight this principle when it comes to dealing with our sins of just going cold turkey. The Bible says we need to depart from sin, but how do we do that? All right, so let me just talk about the principle of, of going cold turkey. Number one, I believe that going cold turkey is the most effective way. Now, again, when it comes to, uh, let's say, uh, one, you know, one, one area where this is used a lot, this, the principle of going cold turkey is in regards to smoking cigarettes. People will smoke cigarettes, and if they say cold, cold turkey, what they mean is they just quit. Just throw out the cigarettes and, and just don't pick it up again. All right, now there's articles out there if you're looking to see uh, input on, you know, whether that's the best way to do it or not. There are some articles out there that say, no, 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 that's not going to work. You'll quit, and then a couple days later, you'll come right back to it. But the studies have shown when they've clinically, like, just done studies, and apparently most people that went into these studies assumed going cold turkey would never work. But after following up with them after a certain period of time, the ones that went cold turkey, you know, they actually stayed, you know, where, you know, I don't know what you say. They stayed smoke free, I guess. And the ones who did the nicotine patches or whatever, minimize, like I'm just going to, uh, uh, you know, just cut back a little bit at a time. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go down to one pack a day <laughs> or whatever much they smoke. I don't know. And they just cut it back, cut it back, cut it back. Usually they just pick it back up again. 
All right. Diets, same way. You know, I, I mean, let's be honest. People just, most people are like, I'm just going to cut my portion size down a little bit, you know, uh, ease back, just start eating healthier and healthier. Man, it, for, at least for me, I know that it doesn't work. All right. What, what, what tends to work, well, I'm not going to tell you what's, what works because obviously I'm not doing it. <laughs> but, uh, I'm telling you, you just gotta make, you just gotta jump in the water. You just gotta, you just gotta rip the band-aid off and do it. And that's really the only way to to, uh, to do it. Okay, so number one, I think it's the most effective way. Look at verse four and five. You're in First Timothy, I mean uh Second Timothy two, verse four and five says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. All right, and then it says, uh, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. All right, this idea of the warfare, you know, we don't want to entangle ourselves. The word entangle has to do with being perplexed or being uh, distracted. You know, we don't want to be entangled with the things of this world. We don't want things holding us back. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 says in verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, it was hard for me thinking of examples. I've got a couple examples that I'm going to use in this message, but it's kind of hard for me to think of what examples should I give in regards to sins that need to be quit cold turkey. You know what I mean? And it was hard for me to think actual ones, but here's the thing. What is your besetting sin? I don't know what it is. What's my besetting sin? I mean, only you can answer that. What's that one sin that you haven't just ripped the band-aid off? It just keeps on uh, 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 entangling your life as a Christian and distracting you from doing the things that you're supposed to do. And it's like this weight, right? That's holding you back from running the race that you're supposed to run. How do you get rid of this thing? And we just need to lay it aside. We need to get rid of it. And, uh, and the Bible says because we're in a war, right? We're in a race. You could say that. There's some urgency. We want to win this race. But I like the analogy of a war when it comes to this because guess what? Let's say you decided. I mean, some of us are too old. But let's say, let's say Braden decided. I wouldn't let him do this, but I'm just kidding. He decided to join the military, right? The military today is not what it was back in the 70s, 80s, right? Let's say he wanted to go to the military and he had a smoking uh, addiction and a drinking addiction. And he doesn't, but let's say he did. And he goes and he joins the military and he gets off the bus and he's like, hey, I'm sorry, Sergeant, but, you know, I've got to have a smoke. <laughs> you know, I've got to I've got to have a drink. You just don't understand. I have this addiction. It's not going to fly as long as you're in boot camp. Nope. There's no smoking. There's no drinking. I mean, they might have had smoke break. I don't, I don't, I don't think they do in boot camp. I think they got to cut all that out and they got to cut it out cold turkey. And the guys that have struggled with their eating habits and they're overweight, guess what? You're on a 2,000 calorie diet. Oh man, I can't do that. I'm going to be too weak whenever I'm running. I'm going to be too bad. You're going to have to suffer for a little while. We're ripping the Band-Aid off right now so that when you get through this, however many week course it is, I don't even know, uh, you are going to be ready. You're going to be fit to, to fight our wars for us. You're going to be ready. You're, going to, you're not going to be entangled. You're not going to be weighed down with the sin that so easily besets you. Uh, you are going to be uh, have some self-control. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people get out of the military and they're smoking and drinking more than they were before they went in. But while you're in boot camp, that's not the case. And it shouldn't be the case, by, by the way, if you're going to be fighting the war. We don't want a whole bunch of drunks out there operating heavy artillery. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, and by the way, the guys operate heavy artillery, what are they, 17, 18 years old? That kind of reminds me of a, uh, of a case that's going on right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Bible says, look at uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Oop, that's not Colossians. It says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, 
fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So he's, saying, he's li listing these lists of sins, and he says, mortify them. Anybody want to take a guess what mortify means? If, uh, kill it, right? If you're mortally wounded, you're, you know, uh, you're dead. If you're mortified... I mean, that's kind of a bad analogy. <laughs> it's like you're dead, right? Whenever you're mortified. Uh, it says mortify the flesh. Mortify. All right. Uh, not too long ago, I don't think I've told this story yet. Maybe I have. I don't know. But not too long ago, I found out we had a church mouse. All right. In Iola, there was a mouse. And I was like, this isn't good. I think it was seen in the mother baby room. And so I was like, uh oh, that's, we got a problem. Now, in the past, I've done those little old-fashioned traps. You pull it back, and then you put the peanut butter on there, and you just got to be real careful because if you bump it, it smacks your finger. And so you put it in there. But this time I said, you know what? I'm going to go a different route. And somebody suggests, I think it was Brother Dean, those big glue traps, right? You got to get the big kind for the rats, right? Because even the mice will carry those little ones off. And so I got one of the big glue, glue traps, came in a few days later, and I caught the mouse. And I was like, now what am I going to do, <laughs> right? Because I went through this, this, this moral dilemma, right? Do I just throw the thing away and let it suffer on the glue trap? <laughs> I know you guys are like, it's just a mouse. But I had to think about this. What's the humane way to kill the mouse? And so I looked it up. <laughs> I was like, what's the most humane way to kill a mouse? Guess what it said? Bash its head in. <laughs> I'm talking about like a like a uh, an animal rights type of thing. Said, hey, it's inhumane to have these things. The most humane way to kill a mouse is bash its head in. And so I went and got a uh, uh, a broomstick, a broomstick. I took the handle upside down and I went over to the thing and I said, ah, this just seems this seems pretty harsh. But guess what? Dead instantly. Why is everybody laughing? <laughs> You sick people. No, I'm just kidding. Dead instantly, out of its misery. And what if I would have been like, <laughs> die, die, right? Maybe eventually it would die, but this one time, it's gone, right? So when I read the word mortify, mortify your members, right? Mortify uh, these things, uh, your members which are upon the earth. And then it says fornication, uncleanness, all these things. Back to our text in uh, 2 Timothy, it says, flee, verse 22, it says, flee fornication as an example. <clears throat> so the first point is just simply, I believe that it is actually the most effective way uh, to, uh, to get sin out of your life, to depart from sin is to do it cold turkey. But number two, <clears throat> think about it this way. If it isn't immediate, then it's not repentance, at least not yet. All right, let's, so let's define repentance real quickly. Because people like to use the word repentance to either mean to be really sorry about their sins or to turn from their sins and stop doing them, you know, and uh, let me think, what's the other way about repentance? But anyway, there's a few different definitions that people give. But the thing is about the word repentance in the Bible, you have to look at the context and see how it's used and what, this, what the setting is. Most of the time, well, I've been told, I haven't counted them up, but I've been told most of the time the Bible says the word repent is talking about God, re God repenting, right? So he's, he was going to do something and then he turned. And it's not that God changes, but... But God puts certain things into, practice, into place where he says, hey, if you do this, I will do such and such. But if you turn, you know, then I'll spare you. And so when someone turns, he changes what he was going to do to them. A good example is Nineveh. If you read the story of Jonah, it says that they turned from their sins. And then it says, and God repented of the evil he was going to do unto them. Okay, Not evil in the sense that God, what God was going to do was unjust, but he was going to bring upon evil upon them. He was going to destroy their, their, their city. And of course, Jonah didn't want them to be spared, so he didn't want to preach to them because he was afraid that they would repent, which is what they did. And so they repented or turned from their sins. And so God repented and he turned from what he was going to do 
to them. Okay, so basically the word repent just means to turn. Some people say change mind, but it's the same idea. If you had your in your mind that something was the truth, but it was false, then you have to change your mind and believe the truth and, and turn your back on that falsehood, okay, so to speak. All right, so let's say that I'm, I'm walking this direction, and I want to stop going this direction, and I want to go the other way. So if I just kind of stop and do this, am I going the other way yet? You're like, okay, yeah, but I'm slowly turning. Do you see I'm repentant? No, you're not repentant yet. I'm repentant. No, you're not repentant yet. You're not repentant until you actually start going the other way, right? So if someone quits a sin cold turkey, they're like, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then they just turn the other way. Then they're repentant. If somebody goes, well, I think I'm going to repent. I'm going to, they're not repentant until they're turned the other way. Does that make sense? So just by the definition of repentance, if you are not doing it immediately, it's not yet, it's not yet repentance. Look at Luke chapter 19. Unless you're defining repentance as being penitent or being sorrow, sorrowful, sorry for something, which actually the Bible says that godly sorrow leads to repentance. What it means is when you feel bad about something because the Spirit convicts you of it, it makes you turn from doing that. Okay, so it's not so much the so the sorrow that is the repentance. It is it's the the turning from that sin that's repentance. In that context, okay, Luke chapter nineteen. Look at verse eight. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man. By false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. Now, here's what I want to show you from this verse. There's a lot we could break down there, but just, just bear, bear with me, okay? Here's what I want you to see. He said, All right, Lord, if I took money from somebody... I'm going to repay him. But Jesus said, this day, you know, has salvation come to your house. Okay, now I don't, you know, again, we can squabble about what it means by salvation there and what it is that was going on in his heart or whatever. Okay, but the point that I'm trying to make is, wait a minute, he hasn't yet repaid those people. He just, told, he just told God that he was going to, but he hasn't yet done it. Okay, so this is the exception. There are some things in your life that you're like, er, I'm stopping right here. I'm turning cold turkey, but it's going to take a while to actually do those. Okay, and this is going to be important for my next point. So, uh, so just keep this in the back of your mind. But example, a thief. Let's say we got somebody he's convicted of being a thief and, you know, we rebuke him. He pays everything back and he's like, I want to be or he, he, he says that he will pay everything back and he's repentant. And so we say, okay, you know, we're restoring you to fellowship and, and no hard feelings. We're going to look past this because you're trying to do everything right. But guess what? He hasn't yet paid it off, maybe. Maybe it's, a, you know, because he's paying back fourfold or something like that. And so it's going to take him a while to pay that back. But we still find that he's repentant in his heart. You know what I mean? That would be a bit of, a, of an exception to this, okay? But here's what I would say. If somebody's in that situation and we find that they're repentant, or let's apply that to yourself. You're repentant. You know, I've changed uh, in my heart, and I'm not going to do this anymore. I want to turn, and I want to I do right. Okay, But maybe it's going to be a long road for you to be able to actually finish that. Uh, you know, Here's what I think we need to do in that case, in our own lives, or in maybe even in force as a church upon somebody who's been uh, on church discipline or something like that, is that I think we would have to have a plan, maybe written out or something like that, and this is what we all can do in our own lives and say, okay, I'm going to have a plan and I'm going to make sure, you know, that this plan is executed. But in my heart, you know, I've already made that turn. Does that make sense? Okay, but that's a little different than somebody who's like, in my heart, I've made that turn and they're still committing a sin every day, you know, little by little. Uh, this would be a problem. I've actually heard 
Uh, I remember actually hearing counsel given to somebody, and this is, I don't hold this against the person that was giving the counsel because they just maybe hadn't thought it through or something, but they were dealing with somebody who had an addiction to pornography. And the counsel was, well, you know, that's a hard addiction to overcome. And so he was thinking logically, and he said, I tell you what will be a good idea. We'll make a little plan, and, you know, you'll you'll check off all the days that you, you know, successfully, uh, you know, kept yourself from doing this or whatever, and we'll just slowly start working down until you get this thing out of your life. And you know what that's like? That's like putting that nicotine patch on and being like, you know, well, you know, I'll just try to cut back, you know. Man, you're going to have to rip that thing off cold turkey and make a clean break and say, I'm not turning back. I'm not going back to that sin, you know, because that's when true repentance takes place. <clears throat> and again, we're not talking about salvation. This is, that's a different message. We're just talking about in the life of a Christian, what did they say in 2 Timothy? It said uh, that we need to depart from sin. Okay, we're talking about how do we do that? How do we get sin out of our life? How do we depart from that so that we can be better soldiers, better warriors for the Lord, better athletes in this spiritual sense, you know, and run the race to the best of our ability? How do we do that? Well, we got to lay aside those weights. We got to get that thing. We got to mortify our members. And, and the best way to do that is to just rip it off and cut it out of your life. Now, again, I'm not, well, let me just get into the next point. Okay, so the next point is this. If one chooses a gradual approach of a, uh, uh, of getting a sin out of their life, okay, and uh, and they choose to take that approach, they're not willing to just rip the Band-Aid off, so to speak, then a sin, particularly a sin, let's take, put it in the context of, of our church, uh, particularly a sin that would get somebody kicked out of church, you know, and they take this approach that says, well, you know what, I'm not ready to just give it up entirely. You know, maybe a little bit by bit, you know, uh, I'll get to a point where I can be restored to the church. You say, who would do that? I've had people do that. I've had people tell me, you know what, I got to work on some things in my life and my personal life. And once I get those things out of my life, then I'll be ready to come back to church. Now, first of all, <clears throat> here are some things to consider. Number one, we know that none of us are perfect. Okay. And if everybody had to be perfect before they came to church, we'd be... Well, I was going to say we'd be sitting there, you know, in a pretty empty service, but I wouldn't be preaching to anybody because I wouldn't be. <laughs> okay, If we had to be perfect in order to come to church, it ain't going to happen. All right. So we're not talking about just every little thing, just have your life perfect. I'm talking about these besetting sins, these big, what we would call big sins, these sins that like our first Corinthians five type sins, which we'll talk about here again in a minute. <clears throat> but we know we're not perfect, and therefore, we know not, nobody else is perfect. Therefore, we want to have as much mercy as we can on these people. And, uh, and if we, uh, uh, I was just thinking about today, uh, somebody, I, when I am driving, you guys already, most people in here know when I'm driving, uh, I have to rely on someone else's navigation skills. <laughs> okay, so somebody said, turn left here. And I turn left and they say, oh, I'm sorry, it was supposed to be right or the other way around. See, I don't even remember which way I turned. <clears throat> and they said, man, I'm sorry. And you know, the, my, what I thought was like, hey, you know, I'm pretty merciful on people that give me wrong directions <laughs> because wouldn't I be pretty hypocritical if you've ever driven with me and know my sense of directions? If I like got mad at somebody, why did you tell me the wrong direction? <laughs> you know, because I totally know what it's like. Now, when we understand that we're all sinners, and we understand that God hates and he despises our sin. Even, the, even if you think your sin's not that big of a deal, God despises that. It's, it's a filthy rag. I mean, it, I mean, even your righteousness are filthy rags. It's, 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 dis, it's deplorable. And when we really realize that, boy, we, we just beg God for his mercy. And we certainly should show mercy on other people that are struggling with different sins and, and all in their life. Okay, so when I'm talking about like, oh, just rip the bandaid off, just jump in. I'm not saying like, and be perfect like me or be perfect like the rest of us in here, you know. No, guess what? If that's the case, we shouldn't even be here, first of all. Second of all, no visitor or somebody that just recently got saved is ever going to be welcome in the church because a lot of these guys are living with uh, with different problems and, and all that. So we, so we do have to understand that. So if somebody says, man, I just can't, I just can't quit cold turkey, okay? 
well, depending on the sin, we have to understand some people aren't going to get an immediate victory over, over something, okay? Some, some do. I've known people that got saved, and as soon as they got saved, they quit smoking, drinking, cussing. I mean, they just, uh, apparently, they seemed like they just quit all these things, and they're just like totally on board and totally just following the Lord. Now, I would say probably that's only when they're around us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Probably, if you're really honest, if you went in home and asked their wife and their children or whatever, you know, they'd probably be like, oh, yeah, they still got sin. All right. But but they're, they they appear like they're doing well. But let's be honest. Like we all know that there's there's certain things going on. So some people are like, man, I can't. I just can't quit, you know, cold turkey. <clears throat> Look at First John chapter 5. Speaking of victory... First John chapter five, starting in verse two, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous for whatso for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, I read one article out there at one point or one uh, commentary or something that was saying like, well, when you're saved, you know, you've got the victory. You can overcome sin and all that. And I would agree that, yes, you can overcome sin. But in the Bible, every time it talks about us having the victory, here's the thing. You don't have the victory. Your victory is... The fact that you're not going to hell because of Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know what I mean? We've got victory over all sin as far as that is concerned. Okay. And so since our victory for our salvation, since our victory over sin is through Jesus Christ, guess who we're going to have to rely on to keep us living the Christian life and to keep us, you know, departing from sin. We sure can't rely on our own flesh. We're going to have to rely on the Lord and the preaching of his word and being around brothers and sisters in Christ that can uh, correct us and rebuke us and keep us from doing these things. Okay, so some people are not going to get victory immediately, but they're still believers. They still, through Jesus Christ, right, they are saints, and we got to remember that. But the thing is, back to uh, our text, 2 Timothy, the thing is, we want for, for okay let me let me put it personal i want for this church to be vessels of honor okay i want for my family to be vessels of honor what do i mean vessels of honor i mean i want god to look at our vessel and be like man this is a clean vessel that i can use this is a vessel, and I don't want to, this is not a sense of, of, of pride, but I want to be the vessel that God gets out because it's like the good China, you know what I mean, that you only get out whenever companies come in. You're just like, oh, man, I'll get, that. I'll get out the good stuff, <laughs> right? I want God to be pleased with this church. Am I wrong for wanting that? No, that's what Jesus wants. He wants to present his church to God as an unspotted and clean uh, bride. And so, uh, and so, uh, my goal for this church, my, my, what my intent should be, is what Jesus wants, and that is that we would be vessels unto honor. Look at, look at uh, 2 Timothy 2. And look at verse 20. Uh, sorry, wrong, wrong chapter. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. You know, some are like that, some are like that McDonald's cup that after it sits there for too long with pop in it, it starts leaking out of the bottom. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's, it's made out of paper. Yeah, they put wax on it or whatever, but it's still not a vessel unto honor. And then some are just, you know, the the, the good, honorable vessel. It says, If a man uh, therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared 
unto every good work. And it says, flee also youthful lust. See, the idea is that we're supposed to try to lay aside that sin, get rid of whatever that besetting sin is. <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, let me see here. So, so cold turkey is the recommended way, I believe, to get the sin out of our life. Now go to 1 Corinthians 5. We've come to this a lot because I think it's very important for people to learn this. And I often say there are big sins and little sins. I might use that kind of terminology. And here's the thing. In a lot of churches, you're going to get ridiculed for saying that because they're going to say, no, 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 a sin is a sin. Now, a sin, if you commit a little sin, like I, like I said earlier, even your righteousnesses are filthy rags. If you commit a little sin, God's disgusted by that little sin. All right. But there are other, there are some sins that God gave the death penalty to in the Old Testament. There are some sins that, according to 1 Corinthians 5, these get you kicked out of church. If we know that you're doing it, we'd kick you out of church. Now, obviously, we want you to get right. It's not like we just hate you because we think we're better than you. We all could fall into any number of sins. Uh, and if we fell into that sin, we would get kicked out of the church as well, okay? And so here's what we see in 1 Corinthians 5. And some of these uh, sound very familiar if you compare it to like, uh, uh, um, uh, what verse did I, did I read in uh, Colossians chapter 3 or, or something like that. <clears throat> he says, uh, verse 9, 2, uh, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs be go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Okay, so when we're talking about inside the church, the people that we're, we're trying to encourage and to exhort to follow the Lord and to do right and to live the best life, uh, you know, uh, cleanest life and, and one free of sin. Okay, again, we got to have mercy because we realize that we're all imperfect. You know, we got to understand that the goal is to bring people back, not to hate them or to be like, oh, how could you do that? Sin? Oh, your sin's so much worse than my sin. That's not the point. But the point is we want to keep God's house, a house that's, that, that's a great house that has vessels of honor. All right. Now there's going to be vessels that are like, eh, you know, they don't do a whole lot of great stuff for the Lord, there's, but, but, but we don't have any reason to like discard them either. Okay. And so, uh, or send them back out. I guess you wouldn't really, I wouldn't like to think, I mean, there's some people that need to be discarded, uh, but there, but for the most part, when we think about our brothers and sisters that we love and we want them to do right, it's not so much discarding them. It's kind of like sending them back to the shop, right? To be <laughs> repaired and to be fixed. Uh, now, now some people say, isn't that what the church is for? Church is supposed to be a hospital. The church is supposed to be like, well, not necessarily. Okay. Uh, in most matters, yes. But there are some things if you just open up your doors to let everybody in and everybody's you know getting together and they're and they're living a wicked lifestyle and they're and they're like influencing each other. Now you've just got this 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 church body that's just all vessels of dishonor and this and, and there's you know a little leaven leaven at the whole lump and all that kind of stuff. So so we want to make sure, particularly with these what I would call big sins. The best way to get rid of them is to just go cold turkey. Now, there's some things that are you're going to struggle with the rest of your life. You're going to have temptations to do certain things. You're going to fall, you know, maybe lose your temper or something like that. Uh, there's a lot of things that you're going to do, and it's wrong. Don't get me wrong. God, God hates all sins. Right? You might have a moment where you, where you fell and you had a lustful thought or you looked at something you shouldn't have looked at. But look, if somebody is caught in, the, in fornication, meaning that they're not married, but they're sleeping around, or even I would say, uh, I would say that pornography is a type of fornication. So somebody's found out to be addicted to pornography. Well, guess what? Rip that off. You know, just, just quit that cold turkey. 
you're either you're either in fornication, right? None of this like, well, well, I'm just going to keep hanging on to this a little bit. You know what I mean? I'm going to keep living with this person, but we'll just try to stay in separate areas of the house. You know, eventually we'll get married, but we're just no, no, no. <laughs> you know, you got to just you got to totally flee from fornication. Okay, and then it mentions all these others. Some of those, like I, you know, I can't as easily make that uh, make that connection as far as rip, as far as uh, going cold turkey. But what about drunkards? Right now, drunkard typically we think of obviously being intoxicated with wine, and you know if they showed up drunk or we understood, you know, we 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 some kind of you know word that they're going to the bar getting drunk at you know every night or, or whatever. You know, this person's a drunkard. Now, personally, I don't think I don't think a Christian should ever even touch alcohol. I don't think it should come to your lips because uh, it's a it's a bad thing. Right? It's a it's a it's something that could lead to obviously some very serious consequences. But I'm talking about people who are who who get drunk and uh, and abuse substances. Okay, now a substance substance abuse goes way beyond just alcohol. Okay, we're talking about drugs. Uh, even smoking to some degree uh, could could be something that's it's not really going to cause you to be uh, unsober, you know. So to me, that one's a little different. Uh, but but somebody who is like a drug addict or you know a drunkard, look, they have got to. We've got to know that that person has cut that off and they're not doing it anymore. Now look. Let's say somebody comes and they're just like, man, I apologize. I messed up. I did this wrong. But, you know, I'm making a 180 degree turn. I'm just getting that out of my life. I want to follow the Lord. I want to get right. We're just like, hey, this person's repentant. This person's trying to do right. And so we receive them back and we say, hey, we're just going to keep on praying for one another. We're going to keep on preaching, doing all the things that we do. And then a couple weeks later, they fall right back into it. But then they say, you know what? I'm going to make a clean turn. I'm going to, yeah. now somebody would be like, well, I don't trust him anymore. You know, what's the Bible say? How many times shall we forgive our brother? You know, if they, if they repent, we're supposed to forgive them 70 times seven, you know, which is just kind of a, a round number. It's not really round. But it's just a, it's just a, it's just a number, right? That, that represents this, this idea that says, just keep on forgiving. Keep on accepting them back, you know, when there's repentance involved. But when it comes down to the person saying, look, that's it, man. I, I, I really mean it this time. The, one, the only way we accept that repentance, and I'm talking about the big sins that get somebody kicked out of church. Okay, the only way that we accept that is if they've made a clean break from it. Which means, hey, you haven't got that out of your life yet. We still love you. Let me know when you come back. No, no, you don't understand. I'm repentant. Well, I don't know that you're repentant until you've actually turned around and you got that thing out of your life. And so, uh, so this is something to to remember. But in our lives, just regular day, you know, regular basis, uh, any sin in our life that is, is that besetting sin, and we're like, oh, let's see, let, let me devise this plan where I can just gradually get this thing out of my life. I'm telling you, the best thing to do is just to rip off the bandaid, just to jump in, and just pull that tooth out, whatever analogy you want to use, and get that sin out of your life because it's hindering you from being a vessel of honor. It's hindering you of you from bringing glory to the Lord, and it's hindering you from even having the right fellowship that you need to have uh, with your brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, uh, first of all, for your mercy. We know that we all fall short of your glory. We all sin, and, uh, and by that standard, I guess we're all uh, vessels of dishonor, uh, Lord. But I pray that you'll help us to be uh, the best that we can. You'll keep working on us. You'll keep getting all the impurities out of us and help us, Lord, whenever we're confronted with these besetting sins in our life. Uh, help us to just just to just to get them out of our, our lives and, and just cold turkey, just, 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 uh, just quit them. And if it's not possible for one reason or, an, or another, Lord, I pray that you help us to be merciful and help us to just uh, uh, pray for these, these people that are struggling with whatever it might be in their life. Uh, but I pray that you help us search our own hearts and see what we can do to clean our own uh, lives up through your spirit, through the work that you've done in us. As you said, that he, uh, he beginneth the, uh, began a good work in us, we'll 
uh, will complete it into the day of redemption. I pray that you'll uh, bless now the service, apply it to our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.